Jonathan.
Even though 
they change and happen over time. And we're living through some of that. We always live through it. And all those things we're still living through. But the thing that does not change is the gospel. The gospel is the same as it was 2,000 years ago, the same as it is now. So I hang my hat on the love story that is the gospel. And this meditation today, if you didn't look at it, um, this is a young man, he's 61 now, he lives in Singapore. At the age of 20, him and some of his friends and their family started a church of about 50 people, Joseph Prince. He now has a global ministry of over 30,000 members. He reaches the globe. You can see him on television if you choose to. But I say all that because his whole message has always been the same. It's the gospel of grace, a God who loves you, a God who wants to help you, a God who wants to guide you, a God who wants to be with you, a God who wants to heal you. It's a consistent, strong, healthy message to a lost world. That's the point of the gospel. So, I turn your attention to today's call to worship. It's already in the program, so I don't need it on the screen. So the reason Nicodemus has to go to Jesus at night is because if he was known to be seen with Jesus, one who sits on the Sanhedrin, the ruling parties of, Jerusalem, of the Jews at the time, he would be <clears throat> ostracized, thrown out of the Sanhedrin, losing all his high standing. It's like a politician. And for him to be seen with Jesus, who at the time is considered a rabble riser, would be totally contrary to his standing. So he goes at night, but he knows something. He knows, and when he calls Jesus rabbi, that's a very great compliment. He's, he's identifying Jesus as a godly teacher, a godly teacher. And he says, I know you've come from God. That's an amazing statement. One time I heard that in my life, when we went down to a mission trip to Guatemala near Haiti, and the people there who were looking for anything they could get from the West in the terms of help, support, even candy, coloring books, whatever it was, water, of course, fresh water, we bring it to them and they said, you people are from God. You people, when you hear that, you go, wow, ah, you people are from God. And we have to represent that. We are godly people who need to represent ourselves as godly people in the world. So Nicodemus, and people should recognize that in us. Why are you the way you are? Anyway, because he said, no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with them. Because Jesus at this point was healing people, casting out demons, um, teaching with authority, and they got the attention of the Sanhedrin. So Jesus answers an amazing statement. Most assuredly, like he can't say any more truer than that. I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The statement has been misunderstood, trampled on, made to be controversial, which it shouldn't. Um, it's really a great <laughs> piece of grace and love that Jesus told Nicodemus. It's not a threat. It's not something odd, although it is otherworldly, because we must understand and tap into the spiritual word. world. If we think we are only flesh and blood, then that would be senseless to us. But if we understand that we're more than flesh and bones, we are more than flesh, you have a soul, you have a spirit, and that's so much what God wants to protect. 
John said earlier in his gospel, of course, John recognized it, um, that Jesus came so we people could understand what it meant not just to be born by the will of man, but by the will of God. Because we can be also born by the will of God, we are born again. We are born again into the very spirit of God himself. But born again, the word used there, well, not born again, but see, to see the kingdom of God. What does it mean to see the kingdom of God? What does that mean? The word see there comes from the Greek, vaiepo, and vaiepo means to understand. It doesn't mean so much to view, we view the kingdom, which we can, it does manifest itself, but it means we understand the workings of the kingdom that we are part of. By that I mean the fellowship, the love, the commitment, the caring, the compassion, the change in our behavior, the change in our attitude, the renewal of our minds, it manifests itself in the church. Every believer on the planet can understand the kingdom of God if they're born again because they're part of it and they understand they're part of a kingdom that is greater than this world itself. That's the point of view. Sometimes it's not so easy to perceive grace and truth. Grace is God's gift to us. What is His real truth? His real truth is that we are all sinners and need a Savior. If you don't think you need a Savior, you cannot be part of the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God was established by a man who died on the cross to save us from our sins. That's the gospel. John 3, 16. Now, you might think this is a typo, <laughs> typographical mistake. See where it says, the reading will be from John 9, 1 through, but you hope it says 14. When you want to say 14, it says 41. Oh. Oh. So I read this at home, and just reading it took me seven minutes. Now as I read it, I have to talk about it a little bit. So that's going to go to 27 and a half minutes. It's, but it's such a beautiful, beautiful, lovely, miraculous, Story and before, just before I read it, a quote to make a little sense of miracles. Don't doubt miracles. They've always, since Jesus' time, they've happened. They happen post Jesus. They're happening now. I think sometimes we short sale miracles. They happen, but we don't. Well, you know, it was a coincidence, or it would have happened anyway, or it wasn't for this or for that. There's miracles, miracles about So, a, a, person I, a person I personally love by his teaching and his writing is Timothy Keller. Most of you know that. He wrote a book, Making Sense of God. He said this um, about the supernatural. When we talk about miracles and we talk about Jesus Christ, we are talking about the supernatural. It's the supernatural. Jesus wasn't just natural, he was supernatural. Even the assertion, this is his quote, even the assertion that science, science, and empirical evidence are the only sure ways to understand reality also assumes its POV, its point of view, is built on faith. Science by its very nature is not fit not fit to investigate whether there is more to reality than the natural world can see. 
for there is no experiment that can prove or disprove that something can happen outside the natural order. They can't prove it, either way. When a supernatural event that's outside the natural does happen, there is no scientific method that can possibly discern the truth of it either way. Eventually, it stands on faith. It stands on faith. Okay, so we'll begin. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. This is important. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? They had a bad understanding of what this physical ailment was or what blindness was. It had nothing to do with his birth, and Jesus answers that. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, this is Jesus speaking, um, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. In other words, he had nothing to do with it, but I can take care of it. I must work the works of him who sent me. He's talking about obviously God his Father, while it's still day, the night's coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. He can do all things. When he said these things, he spat, this is important. I've thought about this many times. So he spits on the ground and makes clay with the saliva, and he anoints the eyes of the blind man with the clay. How miraculous is this planet we live on? How miraculous is the soil? How miraculous is the earth and the dirt itself? We put seeds and bulbs and tubes in the ground and we get life out of the soil. We get all this stuff out of the soil. It's miraculous. Where does it all come from? The nutrients, the minerals, the moisture that's ever in that soil. You put a seed in it, and boom, we have life. I don't think it's any accident. Jesus went into the dirt and then put it on his eyes. The dirt is powerful. This is a story. Now I'm going to get more windy. <laughs> it's my fault. So, beside this, this biologist felt he could channel with God and had a conversation with God and said, God, I can do everything you can do in a test room today. I can, I can make life out of a test room. Okay, God says, let's do it. Well, I had to get, my, get some dirt first. He says, get your own dirt. Get your own dirt. Anyway, then he tells him to go wash in the pool of Salaam, which translated sent. Because people went there, they were sent there to be healed. So he went to the pool to be sent. So he goes, he walks, and he comes back seeing. Therefore the neighbors and those previously that were with him said, Huh, is not this the one that begged? Some said, this is he. Others said, it's like him. No, he said, it's me. I'm him. I'm you. Therefore they said to him, How? Or your eyes open. This is important, you gotta follow this. He answered and said, A man, a man called Jesus, made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool, wash. So I went and washed, received sight. So they said, Where's this Jesus now? Where's he now? He said, I don't know. No. So they brought him. I'm in verse 13. It's going pretty quick, church. Be patient, it's going quick. <laughs> they brought him, formerly was blind. They brought him to the Pharisees, he was blind. Now it was the Sabbath. Oh, bad news, bad news. But Jesus, don't you dare heal on the Sabbath. When Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes, then the Pharisees also asked him again, how he had received his sight? He said to them, he put clay on my eyes and washed. Now I see. That's the truth. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God. 
Why isn't he from God? Because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. There's a big thing, you all probably heard it before, legalism or ritual over relationship. We can't tie ourselves into rituals that seem to be appropriate for the right timing of things, even in the church, over what the relationship means to do something of good works and powerful and to heal and help another. I talked a little bit about that last week. You can't put legalism over true beauty in life. And the Pharisees, you know what it's like? I'll tell you what it's like. The law was given to us, the law, to tell us what we couldn't do and we can't do it. Jesus came to put the law in our hearts, in his flesh and blood. And he lived the law, just don't have the law written in stone. You know what it's like? I use this boilerplate analogy. I reduce it to this. Why do we need stop signs at intersections? Why do we need them? Why then? Because we don't know enough to stop. If they weren't there, what would happen? Could you imagine take any corner you want? Oh, take the one at uh, Days Market and Showcase Sun. No traffic lights. Oh, hallelujah, what a field day. <laughs> because we don't know enough to stop. He has to tell us, stop doing that. Don't do that. If you do that, the consequences are not good. But now he wants to put it in our heart. So he said, when I go to an intersection where there isn't a stop sign, guess what happens to me? I yield. <laughs> I'll stop. Do I need a stop sign every time I come to an intersection? Somebody could, or some car could be coming the other way. But it's not a stop. Oh, I didn't break the law. No, I just got in a severe accident. So Arthur said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? Good question. And there was a division among them. Jesus always causes controversy, some kind of division, because of who he was and what he's trying to put into our hearts. And we can't put it. Anyway. They said to the blind man again, what you say about him because he opened your eyes? He said, now listen to this. First he said, some man came named Jesus. Now we have a little more time to think, and he says, oh, he's a prophet. This man will heal him. I think he's a prophet. He changed the way he saw Jesus. That's why the title, seeing, I could have made the title, seeing but still not believing, but instead I made a positive of seeing and believing, but there are still some who see and still do not believe. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that had been blind and received his sight. So they called his parents. And they asked them, is that your son? And was he born blind? And how's he seen now? I'm in verse 28, 20. His parents said to them and said, Oh, hey, that's our son, we know that. He's born blind, but now he sees, and we don't know how. Or he'll open his eyes, and we don't know. Um, this is funny. It's funny if, if you can understand people. Understand people. Go ask him. He's old enough. Stop asking me. That's what they said. Go ask him. He'll speak for himself. Oh, so the parents did this because they also feared the Jews because if they confessed that they thought Jesus was the Christ, they'd be in trouble too. So they said, just ask him. The other parents had asked him. So I'm not on verse 24. More than halfway there. <laughs> so they again called the man who was blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. 
one thing I know, because this is a great line in scripture, that though I was blind, now I see. Now I, now he's, now he, he's not only getting past the physical blindness, he's getting into a spiritual awakening that this person who did that to him is more than just some man. He's thinking prophet, something different. So they said to him, what did he do to you? How did your eyes open? He answered them, this part's funny. We have 27 is funny, church, get this, it's funny. I told you already, don't you listen? <laughs> don't you listen? Really? Why do you want to hear it again? You want to become one of his disciples? Oh, 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 oh. He's giving it right back to him. Not only is he becoming like a peg, he's becoming a stronger testimony, a stronger person. So they reviled him and said, well, you're one of his disciples, aren't you? No, he wasn't. But we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we don't know where he is from. So the man answers again and says to them, this is verse 30, well, this is a marvelous thing, that you don't know where he's from? Did he open my eyes? Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper, worshiper of God, excuse me, and does his will, he hears him. Since the world began, now listen to this, this is a man who was a beggar, who couldn't see, who, and perceive, he could see in the physical sense, but also perceive many things, Suddenly, it's teaching the Pharisees. This beggar is telling them, since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who has been born blind. I need to stop there for a second. The reason I need to stop there is, this is the first recorded place in history that a blind person at birth, at birth, has ever been made to see and Jesus did. And this fellow knew it. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Good point. They answered him and said to him, You were completely not. They're so angry. You were completely born in sins, and you're teaching us? It says here they cast him out. They throw him out. Get out of here. Even though you're telling us the truth, guess what? We don't want to hear it anymore. We don't want to hear the truth. We want to live in our Sabbath rules. We don't care how good this man was. We better live in the comfort of what we know. True vision and dwell. And today, today, and today, and Jesus heard the day. So Jesus heard they threw him out. And when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? Good question, isn't it, church? It's a good question. It's right there. It's up to us. Do you see? Do we perceive? Do we understand? Do we believe in the Son of God? Have you been healed? Do you now see? Do you now understand? Are you part of the kingdom? Are you part of the church? Are you part of the worldwide global movement that is this kingdom? Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may? He wants to, he wants to, he wants to. Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. He says, Then, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. So he goes from just a man to the Son of God that he would worship him. And that's what we do. If we perceive the kingdom, we worship him. So Jesus says, he closes with this, For judgment I've come into the world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may be made blind. He's talking about hypocrisy there. He gets greater hypocrisy, people who think they see, or pretend they see, but they don't really see. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard those words and said to him, Oh, so I guess you think we're blind. So Jesus says to them, If you were blind, because this is, Jesus had a great way with words. So it makes you think about them a little bit. If you were blind, you would have no sin. 
meaning it's not your fault yet because they haven't been opened. But you say, we see, therefore your sin remains, because they're seeing incorrectly. Again, he's talking about one thing he called them a few times in his life was hypocrites. The, he was calling out the hypocrisy, that they say they see, but they don't really see. They only see what they want to see. Closing quote, in church, you've been great, you've been great. Um, and, um, but you don't have to, never mind. Um, last thing, and this is a quote from Pastor Joseph Prince, who started that church at the age of 20, and he hangs his hat again on the great strength of one's faith in the Lord that will carry you from not only one day to the next day, one week to the next week, one month to the next week, but into eternity. Faith is not trying to make something that is already there happen. Do you get that? This is his quote, but I love it. it. Faith is not trying to make something happen that already has happened. Faith is bringing out the spirit in you and in the world to see what is already there and already true for us who believe, for it is the God of miracles. And we are part of his miracle. Let us stand together and sing for her, because we see. What's the closing hymn? Tell me, God. Tell me, God. Oh, oh, I was. I was. I was. 499. 499.